Hey, welcome back to the Albert Tate Podcast. Thank you so much for signing up, for subscribing. Listen, would you please share with your friends, tell your friends to come on. These are conversations uh, that will shape and inspire and encourage your soul. Uh, The theme for this season is all about moments that shaped us. And I had a fascinating conversation with the president of Fuller Seminary as we talked about uh, the moments when endings shaped you. Um, We talked about endings and how endings happen in different seasons of our lives and how those endings then impact and shape our lives. Dr. Laverton had some amazing insight on how endings have shaped him in different seasons and different times of his life and even career. Grab your popcorn, get ready. It's going to be a fascinating conversation as we listen to moments that shaped us. Endings with Dr. Mark Laverton from Fuller Seminary. Stadia has had the honor of helping hundreds of great leaders start new churches. We have a passionate desire to make sure that every child on the planet can experience the overwhelming love of Jesus Christ through the local church. This vision compels us to ask one very important question. Who's next? Who are the leaders that God is raising up to plant new churches? Who are the leaders that that will answer the call to say, I'll follow, I'll raise up this generation, the next generation to know Jesus Christ and to change the world forever? Are you ready to start your church planting journey? Perhaps you know someone who is. Stadia is ready to help and we'll be with you every step of the way because we won't stop until every child has a church. We've got Dr. Mark Laberton in the building today. Dr. Laberton, how you doing? Hey. I know you want me to call you Mark. You don't have to preach at me, but (laughs) I love calling you Dr. Laberton. But Mark, how you doing? Hey, fine. So we are in we are in your office. Absolutely. And I don't know if we can get (laughs) shots of this. Maybe we can add it, but you've got some amazing art in here. But this piece behind us, what's the significance? Uh, uh, because anyone that's seen your podcast or heard your podcast knows about knows that knows this image. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, a bunch of years ago, a friend of mine who was a fine artist painter suggested that I would love to paint, and um, I thought I had no interest in painting. I have a lot of creative interests, but that isn't one of them. And um, so she gave me that canvas, and uh, she then realized I wasn't using it because it was a pristine canvas, four feet mm. by five feet of perfect whiteness, and I thought, no way am I, who was not a painter, going to paint on that. And uh, so she said, look, why don't I just bring over some paints and some paintbrushes and other stuff, we'll just make a mess on the canvas, and then I'll leave all that stuff with you, and then you can either decide you want to paint or not. So um, so we did that, that was the canvas, that was the first canvas uh, that I ever painted on, and I've probably painted five or six paintings underneath that, but in the end, uh, one day I was meditating on the book of Job, and I thought, you know, the whirlwind is really my description of what life is uh, actually about most mm. of the time. And, um, and God in the midst of the whirlwind is the big question of the human experience. Is there a God in the whirlwind? And uh, so I you know, had a fun time just playing on that. I'm no painter, but I do paint often. And uh, so I painted that painting to talk about the whirlwind and the faithfulness of God. That's amazing. Yeah. That's my, it looks great. <laughs> Thanks. I'm yeah. thinking you about to tell me about some famous painter. <laughs> oh yeah. And you did. Yeah, yeah, You're, exactly. You are the famous, yeah. <laughs> the famous That's painter. That's amazing. So it's a, it's a depiction of the chaos uh, and the whirlwind and is there a God in the midst yeah. of the whirlwind? Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. How have you wrestled um, and what have you discovered as in your pursuit of finding the answer to that question? Well, in the painting, uh, the suggestion of the red line that goes through the whirlwind uh, is uh, is partly uh, a sense of that, but you can obviously look at the whirlwind and not see the red line. That's right. Good. It's like the burning bush. You can easily be near the burning bush and be so overwhelmed by everything else that's around it that the likelihood that you're going to hear God in the burning bush is pretty small. Um, and I think. Uh, my sense is that God is absolutely in the whirlwind, yeah. but easily missed. So the question mm. is, how do we become attuned to God's presence? That's amazing. Yeah, I want to have a conversation with you. Kind of, kind of, it kind of deals with that. The whirlwind that happens, um, 
when when there has to be when there when God invites us to end things, um, I want to talk about endings mm-hmm. um, and how those endings shape us, change us, form us. Mm-hmm. Personally, in your life, is there a time when you had to end something? Um, and what was the process of ending it? And what did God show you? And what did you learn? And how were you shaped and formed by having to end it? Well, it's interesting. Um, when you first started the question, I thought it would be about endings as opposed to endings that I've chosen. So mm. uh, there's obviously a difference between endings that are forced upon you mm-hmm. and ones that you elect, mm. right? Interesting. So the first thing that came to my mind uh, was probably the fact that as a pastor, I've been with many, many people in the endings of their lives. And, mm. um, and you know, over the course of 30 plus years of pastoral ministry, I've probably walked with maybe five, four hundred or more people to their death in some way or another, some aspect of that story. And sometimes um, those endings are especially poignant. The one probably that is, besides my parents' death, the one that would be the most important would be the death of my friend Steve Hainer, who was um, was a, a person that I met the year that I became a Christian and really was my closest friend for 43 years until he died of pancreatic cancer uh, about three years ago. Mm. And that ending, which took place over a brief period of time, it was actually uh, right after Easter that, uh, that he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and by the, by the next January he had died. Wow. Um, and because of the significance of this friendship that was a, though we had not lived in the same area for decades, it was a every week sometimes every day kind of friendship, right? Where you mm-hmm. had lots and lots of contact. Yeah. And the significance of his life and, and our friendship meant that the, the significance of that ending was profound and continues uh, to this day to affect me uh, almost every day in, hmm. in various ways. Um, it's partly because not only were we such great friends, but it was also the fact that we had parallel professional and ministry lives. So. He, at the time of his death, was the president of Columbia Theological Seminary in oh, wow. Decatur, Georgia. Uh, so our ability to compare stories, have professional conversations, as well as friendship conversations. He was also a Presbyterian minister. He was also somebody who had a lot of the same, both circle of people, but also passions and commitments to things in the world that we believe matter to God. Mm. So a lot of that is, wow. was disrupted in a, in a big way. And because he was so otherwise healthy to die at 66 when you're an extremely vital uh, person is a pretty profound thing. I did experience God's grace. His death was one of the most joyful deaths I've ever been around. I mean, there's a long story that is probably more than you would want to go into in this context. but that he, he had, like many people, had a kind of a revival moment, which often happens close to death, where you've, you're nearly at death, and then all of a sudden you have a surge of energy. Oh, yeah. Um, and consciousness and articulation mm-hmm. and all that. Mm-hmm. Only his lasted for about almost 72 hours mm. of full-on Steve's back. I mean, it was like fully back. So he's up out of bed, he's walking around, we're having hysterical times telling old stories, we're laughing. There's unbelievable joy in the circle. Are of you there people. with him yeah. in his city now? The, the circle yeah. of his family and, and this uh, group of friends. It, it's all the most uproarious stuff. And at various moments, he would say, "Wait, wait, wait! I have to lay back down. I'm in the process of dying. <laughs> I've I've got to die now." Now, none of that. That's fantastical stuff, right? I mean, if I hadn't actually wow. been there watching this, I would have thought this just doesn't happen, or you're overstating it, or yeah. it wasn't really as dramatic as you're describing. I'm being really understated in how how dramatically he came back. He and then, just as abruptly, he just died. And so the joy, which he wrote about all during his dying process with his wife, Cheryl, mm. which has now been published in a book, was an amazing expression of God uh, meeting a person in their dying mm. in deep and profound joy. I put that in comparison to the debate and conversations that Kate Bowler, who's at Duke, uh, is having with people. She's recently written this amazing book called 
uh, everything happens for a reason and other lies I've believed. Mm. And it's an amazing book about, a, in her case, being a 37-year-old woman, uh, a tiny little boy, and suddenly being diagnosed with fourth stage cancer. And her studying of the prosperity gospel intermixed with all of that. So I've often compared her story in this time of, of um, confusion over how do I understand the presence of God, which has been mm. honest and raw and hilariously funny and mm. profound, and Steve's, which is the same kind of honest, faithful journey. So those endings have given me, uh, and, and fortunately, uh, in the case of Kate, it's not at the ending yet, yeah. but about endings. The book is entirely yeah. about endings and how yeah. we understand the character of God. I think it's been, it's given me great um, optimism and mm. hope in the face of endings, even more than I had before. I feel like I've accompanied lots of really wonderful endings. Yeah. Um, that was that was an ending that was brought upon you. Yeah. Um, which is which is fascinating. It makes me want to go read Steve's book now. I'll uh, give it to you. Yes, I mean, that, that sounds fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about an ending that you chose. Probably the most um, difficult ending that I've experienced was uh, when I was serving as a pastor of a church where I felt quite literally from almost the first day that I was the wrong person in the wrong place. Hmm. Now, I have strong intuition, so I'm also suspicious of my intuition. So I know it and recognize it, but I'm also disciplined in not giving it its head necessarily. And but you use, are you usually, is your intuition yeah, used? It's usually yeah. pretty right. Yeah. So I'm thinking, so this is like having just become the pastor of a church that I shouldn't have become the pastor of. And I'm in the installation service where in the formalized way I'm being made the pastor. And I'm realizing I'm the wrong person. Like this is the wrong thing. <laughs> and uh, if I'd been on my own, I would have probably been convulsive. That's how strongly I felt it. Really? Um, the, the chair and the vice chair of the committee that called me were standing beside me. I started to cry. They thought this was a sign of my bonding. Surrender and, and yes, And Lord. joy and yesness to this. Whereas, in fact, it's like, help! Every anxiety dream I'd ever had in my life was now being lived out in real wow. time. Okay. So... Now I have to ask myself, of course, what am I going to do with this? How do I handle this, right? So I felt like, well, <clears throat> uh, the theme of the whirlwind uh, comes to mind. <laughs> and um, you think, so let me listen for the voice of God in the midst of the whirlwind. How do I understand what it is that I should be doing? So I just launched in, in every way that I could to try to be the most... To be the, 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 the pastor. The, the pastor that I believed uh, they needed someone to be yeah. and that I was there called to be. It had all been done in good faith. There'd been yeah. no coercion. There'd been no failure to disclose anything. There was no, there was nothing that had usurped anything. It was just this fundamental feeling that I didn't fit in this yeah. setting. But people need the gospel. People need to be loved. People need uh, adequate attention. There needs to be a whole variety of things about vision and mission and so forth that need to be clarified. So you just launch in mm. as though you're there for 35 years, which uh, in the best way, would have been my imagination of what it is that we were doing. Um, now, this wasn't against, this wasn't suddenly something that happened in that service. I'd had a sense of this before, but for various reasons, the narrative changed in my mind. I thought, well, yeah. okay, so it doesn't feel like it's a perfect fit, but it's a faithful risk, and God will assemble it in a way mm -hmm. that will make it get confirmed in the right way. Yeah. That never really happened. Though, I will say without hesitancy at all that God was incredibly faithful in that period of time. And How long did you do it? I, yes, I did it for 18 months, which is a very brief period of time and uh, was about 18 months of the longest season of my life. Not because it was anyone else's torture, but because it felt to me like I'm just not the you never right did person like for this right. place. Yeah, it was never right. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that you just bail, right? I mean, I have too much of a desire to try to be faithful to what I've promised. To be but should you have bailed and saved yourself well, 18 months? Well, touche. So now here we are in the process about of about, um, let's see here. It was about eight months later mm -hmm. that, um, that I was called by a church that uh, said, we'd like to consider you to be our pastor. And I said, well, it's really nice that you'd call, but um, 
and it's true that I have questions about whether I'm in the right place. However, uh, I need to keep my nose in the game here. And if you come to the very end of your search process and you haven't found the person that you think might be the right person to be the pastor, without any arrogance at all, I'm just saying to you, I, I, I might be able to have a conversation with you then. That I presumed would be a couple year process or something. Interesting. Um, but I'm not going to have the conversation with you now. I need to try to be faithful to what I've promised. So I keep going down the road. I'm very candid with my wife. I'm candid with other people in an appropriate way, I hope, about what I'm experiencing, but nevertheless trying mm -hmm. to be faithful to the call that was there. Long story, about six months later, the same church calls back and says, um, we are now at the end and you are on our list and we'd like to have people come and uh, watch you preach. So uh, when this happened, they were anonymous. They just came and sat in the congregation. Mm. Some of their faces I recognized. So, um, so I could see that they were there. This happened for four weeks in a row. It was, oh, a, wow. it was a, uh, the, the next Sunday after that. I thought, oh good, I'm so glad that's over. I'm sure they're not gonna, they're done now. And mm. I'll probably hear back that they're not gonna take things further or whatever, but that's, that'll be at an end. Instead, I stood up at, to preach and the church had a high uh, pulpit and you could only really see the back row when you were standing in the pulpit. And there they all were as a whole committee sitting <laughs> in the back of the room. <laughs> and they afterwards then came and said, you know, would you be willing to uh, meet with us this afternoon? Oh, so, wow. so we had this great meeting and, um, and it was, you know, a, a lots of things happened, <clears throat> but here's the critical thing. So eventually I had to really wrestle with, am I really called to leave or am I not? Is this a temptation or is this a, a calling? Yeah. And so the hard part was that it felt to me like the church that had called me had done a completely good faith effort there. They were being responsive to what I was doing. There mm -hmm. was a lot of uh, desire for many of the things that were happening in the life of the church. Mm -hmm. And still to me, it felt like it was not the right setting. So I set aside three days to, uh, to just be on my own. Mm. And I was praying about this call, is it, a, is it a temptation or is it a vocation? And I remember preparing a cup of coffee, getting ready to sit down on, in a chair, and suddenly it felt to me like the Holy Spirit said to me, so you're the one who never made grandma cry. Is that the kind of leader you're going to be? And I just literally said out loud, no. And then I felt like I'd just sort of been pantsed by the Holy Spirit. Meaning that phrase, which I had never used, was a phrase that related to my childhood that involved uh, having my maternal grandmother live with us in the time that I was born until she died when I was in ninth grade. Huh. I'd been the good grandson. My brother had been the bad grandson. Mm -hmm. I was the one who never made grandma cry. My brother was the one who sometimes did, though he was a really good grandson too. But my point was, it was like an identity of satisfying other people's expectations. Whoa, that's some deep. So now, suddenly, like the so yeah. Holy Spirit has yeah. a has a tone with everybody. Your Holy Spirit sounds like a therapist. Yes, huh? exactly, <laughs> exactly. And in this moment, it was like, so is that what your whole life's going to be about? Like. Making, making sure that everyone cry. around you feels okay. Oh, wow. And the Holy Spirit, I felt, went on to say, because we can't really have the conversation about whether it's a temptation or a calling if the goal is not to offend someone. Yeah. That's, that's a different kind of leadership, if that's which, your goal. Which is, a, if, you're trying to, if you're praying about something ending in your life, right. that's a big thing. That is a big It's almost thing. the whole thing. Right, because a disappointment is part of almost any... Chosen it's inevitable. ending, yeah. right? And leadership is endlessly choosing endings for mm. yourself or for other people or for the institution or community mm. that you might be leading, right? So then the next question was, uh, if I was calling you to this new call, are you able to take it even if it's not neat and tidy? Mm. Now that was interesting to me because it was really just pushing in further, saying, if you went, it's because I'm calling you. It's not going to settle easily and it will be awkward. So can you still hear my call? Or wow. can you only hear my call when it's neat, tidy, easy, straightforward, uncomplicated, wow. right? Wow. So in the end, uh, I did believe through those days that God had given me a very strong calling to mm. uh, this new position. 
there's more to that story that's not worth going to at the moment, but what ends up happening then is that I realize, but I can't choose to hear that call outside the setting that I was in. I felt like the vocation of the, of the departure, which is what was, this was about, can I call you to an ending that you do not want and are not choosing and will open you to criticism and will disappoint people? Mm. I felt I can't, I can't do that absent the setting. I need to be in worship. I need to be with the community of people. And in that setting, in my own spirit, say, yeah. I am going to disappoint these people in responding to your call. And can and, 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 and in that, can you be, are you okay with that? Do right. you feel at can peace? I live, can, can I live, live at peace yeah. with that? Yeah. Right. For me, for a personality like mine, yeah. that was yeah. just torture, right? Oh, Absolute my torture. Yeah. So I came to think the answer to that was yes, but the, it played out further because I realized that then when it came time to announce that I was going to leave, that I didn't want to hide behind God and I didn't want to hide behind a new vocation. I wanted to say, and I think I was right in doing it this way, I'm going to say, I'm going to cho I've chosen to leave. I'm choosing to take another call and I'm going to be saying goodbye. And I'm not going to say this in the name of God or in the name of, I, that mattered deeply to yeah. me. But to the, to the exercise that I felt this whole season was about, it was, I'm going to stand in public and do the displeasing thing mm. in freedom and in the confidence that I do believe it actually is God's calling. Mm. For me, that was an enormously important test about leadership, right? Can I be in your presence and displease you? Can I be <clears throat> in your presence and offend you? Yeah. So I actually said, <clears throat> I sent a, um, a letter explained what I was doing, absent all the kind of theological, spiritual language that might have mm -hmm. kind of guarded me in some yeah. sense. And on that service, the next Sunday when, I, when we were all together, I said, it was having to be a communion service, and I said, um, so here we are today uh, to worship God. I sent out a letter explaining to you that I've decided to take another position and I'll be leaving in a short period of time. Um, today we're going to come to the communion table, and in some ways for some of you, this really feels then like Judas is presiding at the table because I'm betraying your trust. I'm betraying the... the so you went there. You I said that totally in the service. I totally went there. Um, and to me, it was like one of these Rubicons, right, where you cross it and you say, I'm going to say actually what I know you feel mm. because you've done nothing wrong. I mean, yeah. th this is not about you. This is about a journey that is my own... Mm. Uh, discernment and my own awareness of the presence and vocation of God in my life. So, so, um, and, and then I said, so the question is going to be, as we came to the communion table that day, I kept weaving it through the whole service. So, so now, right now, having now just preached on 1 Corinthians 11, whether we eat and drink in unity or not, um, I said, so now we have to decide, are we together at this table because of the love of Jesus Christ that holds us even in our mutual pain and uh, confusion, even worse, blame, mm. or are we going to decide that we can't come to the table together today? I want to call us to a unity that isn't about agreement about whether I should stay or whether I should go, but an agreement in seeking to be earnest followers of Jesus who call us to hear sometimes difficult and hard things and to do what we believe uh, is wow. before us. I think, I, so my point about telling that long story is that it was really, for me, one of those endings of choosing that was really hard, mm. felt completely painful. I hated disappointing people in that way. I also felt it was right. I absolutely felt called to the next thing. Mm. But to end well meant sitting in the ending, not rushing the ending, not deflecting the ending, not blaming them, not making it out to be something mm. that really it was and not. And not using Christian jargon to right. shield yourself from any responsibility that you right. had and con and contributing to this disruption right. that they know is their natural right. family. I want to own that I am an agent of this moment. Wow. For me as a leader, that was an extremely important transition. And oh, wow. obviously, in the years since that time, that lesson has been indispensable. I mean, how many times a day am I in that situation? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, tell me about the people in just a very practical way because you was worried about disappointing them, worried about 
their disapproval? How did they respond to you? Well, I would say overall people were incredibly gracious. It's a very mm -hmm. gracious culture. It's a kind of polite culture. Mm -hmm. um, there were some people who were very angry mm -hmm. and I encouraged them to tell me about their anger and I, if I heard that they were particularly angry, I went to them and said, can we talk about your anger over my leaving? I want, I want you to be able to say what it is that really bothers you about this. Really? And I frequently did that alone. Sometimes I would do it with someone else. Um, but it felt to me like it was all part of continuing to step toward the pain, toward the disruption, toward the hurt, um, not away from it. Now, yeah. I would say, honestly, they were an incredibly gracious community. And I think a lot of people understood it as a, a move to a place that was known to me, to a place that yeah. uh, that involved people. It was kind of like a homecoming. Mm -hmm. That was not actually what it was for me. It was it was really about something much uh, mm. more profound than that and um, much more complicated in the mm. end, which involved lots and lots of chosen endings. Mm. So in a way, the whole exercise of leadership is about endings and beginnings. and. Um, and you're constantly doing both, and hopefully you can do both. I know a lot of leaders that only do beginnings. Or and a lot of leaders that only do endings. Well, touche. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like, I just think of, I mean, some people just know how to end things well. They right. just come and just bring, you know. Right. That's interesting. Right. But I tend to think that more pastors do not end well. No, no, no. Yeah, uh, you're right. They you're right. Yeah. they walk and, away. And even when I talk about endings, I know people, I know I know leaders that know how to blow stuff up. Yeah. And not yeah, necessarily yeah, yeah. build it up. Yeah. So they know how to just blow, just yes. let's just let's just destroy. Right. And right. not just not just build. Yeah. I um are you the one that didn't make grandmother cry? And is that gonna be your story in life? I think that's a lot of people. A lot of people live right there in that space. Right. But they don't want people to cry. They don't want people to be disappointed with them. They don't want people they wanna please people. And they get stuck in making the decisions. And you're saying you've got to deal with that right. before you come to the decision-making table. Right. Yeah. Well, and this is where I think every leader, and certainly most pastors that I know, are, are more shaped by fear than they are by almost anything else. And this is one of the fears. There's many, but this is one. Oh, it's big. It's very big. Because people, who doesn't want people's approval? Right. Who doesn't want to be liked? And right. who wants to make decisions that, and here's the thing, here's the thing that I've learned, especially in the last few years. Everyone knows that this is the right decision, but also everyone's pissed that you're making it. Yes. <laughs> and it's like, we both agree that this is the right thing to do. Right. But I'm standing on the island alone <laughs> right. because no one likes the implications of it. Right. So right. In, in, in many senses, does that, and I don't know, I'm young, so this is where you can speak into me and encourage or give me perspective. To me, that builds the island of isolation that many leaders sit on. Right. Because when you make that decision, no one wants to sit at you at the lunch table. Right. Or even if they do, you don't feel like they're near you. You feel isolated. Right, right. Yeah, I think it depends, too, on how you've come to those decision-making moments, whether you've created a scenario where you've almost built your own island. Um, whereas Touché. I think a lot of it has to do with can we, if we really are together in this, then how do, how do I build a meaningful, not co no not coercive, but cooperative, genuine consensus where other people are shouldering the or decision. Carrying it with you. Yeah. And then you come to it and you say, I, I am the leader who's gonna give voice to this, but we are really standing together in doing this, mm, right? And I think good. this is where a lot of the questions of whether people isolate themselves deliberately, almost to be the hero and or anti-hero, yeah. rather than actually see themselves as part of a community that needs together to hold responsibility and authority and decision making in most cases, not in every case, but in a lot of cases, it needs to belong to the community, not just to the... So leadership does not have to be an island. It doesn't. doesn't and I think happen. most times we operate as though it does, mm -hmm. but it really doesn't. And mm -hmm. I think it fosters and achieves exactly what it would seem to naturally lead to, which is isolation and a feeling that you, you alone are either the hero or you, you alone have to be the the anti-hero. So that's really, uh, that's really an isolation of our own making more than it is an isolation of anything else. But isn't it, I'm blown away at how many great leaders, uh, a leader, one of the leaders that we were just, that we were just talking about off camera, when, when moral failure comes or when they're, 
uh, reputation gets tarnished or when something comes up or when something goes there, when you trace the root of it, oftentimes you find and discover that they've actually been living in their own little isolation for a long time. Right. And this kind of failure or disruption is inevitable. You right, know what I mean? Right. But there's so many different kinds of isolations, aren't there? I mean, different things can isolate people. Again, it can be fear. It can be shame. It can be an, a sense of, um, of, of inadequacy that mm. in various ways. And they all play in different ways. They create a different kind of isolation. So yeah, I think the combination of factors often leads to a sense that a person's been in their own isolated world, but why they've been in that isolated yeah. world could really be caused by many different things. Mm. And, and I think that's when in the unpacking of those moments of, of sadness and pain and tragedy have to be unpacked wisely and gently and carefully so that you're, the person that's involved is really not just being told, quote, you should have had a better accountability group. Really? I mean, that's, that's a pretty superficial analysis. The question is, why are, have you chosen to live life the way that you have? Where are you in your understanding of what it means to be a, a human being in communion with other people, mm. in deep personal and profound relationships, where you are known and knowing others, right? Mm. I mean, it's a whole thing about how you've carried all of life, not just how a certain set of circumstances led you to be more isolated in such a way that you indulged yourself. That, that's true, perhaps, but it doesn't get at the root of what something greater all of that's really about. There's, some, yeah. there's a much deeper story that's unfolding. Wow, that's good. Um, one of the big uh, endings um, is Fuller Seminary, 70 years old. Right. Um, uh, a staple in Pasadena, California. Right. Um, currently the president. Right considering moving this institution from its historical landmark right. to another location. Right. You want to talk about a significant ending. There's a significant ending. That's a significant ending. <laughs> a significant ending. How, at what point does this become a valuable option in your mind? Over the last year, years, is this something that's always been in some drawer somewhere and you pulled it out and says it's time for this plan? Or did you look at something and say, we've got to move and now I've got to lobby this, or is it one thing? Is it was it a, was it an aha click? Whoa! Or was it a all right? We got to go to that plan that everyone's always talked about. Well, it's interesting. Uh, the first time that the board of trustees ever talked about moving Fuller was 50 years ago, and it happened because the cost of living in Pasadena was too high. So that sounds like a familiar narrative. Would that not be <laughs> one way of simply summarizing the narrative today? Yeah. yeah. So 50 years ago, there's, there have been four times when the trustees have seriously thought about possibly moving Fuller. Each time, it's driven, it's been driven by questions of economics. Mm. The question is, how do you get beyond the economics? So are there economic factors that are, that are part of what Fuller's having to face? Absolutely, the changes in education, higher education, theological education, the church, all that's affecting Fuller, as it is many other institutions. So all that's happening. But the question is, what do you do with this inflection point, right? And the exciting part of this ending is actually simultaneously a beginning. So for us, it actually seems as though it's a truth telling about the real challenges and the issues that we have to face. But it's simultaneously saying, how do we position Fuller for the, for the best possible thriving future mm -hmm. for the next 70 years? Mm -hmm. And that's the challenge that we're facing. So it means you have to do both of these things with integrity. On the one hand, you have to grapple with all of the realities and the challenges and the implications of leaving a city, a place, a location of memory, profound influence, rootedness, identity, history, just in the most rich possible way. Yeah. And then replant in a context that's going to be different, that's going to require and also create opportunity for completely different paradigms of how mm. we both continue the work that we've been doing always and innovate in ways that are going to be reflective for the way that theological education, we believe, is going to be done more and more in the future. Mark, as you, as a leader, though, as you gear up for this kind of uphill battle of saying, I, this is my tenure, I'm the president, and on my watch, we are going to move this institution. Would like, you like to sign up for that opportunity? <laughs> no, 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 no. You got it down. If you'd like it, Albert, right, I'd be right. happy to share no, it no, with no, you. No, 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 no. 
personally as a leader, what's your personal process um, with God, with your, yourself, with your team, with your community to get you ready to take on such a daunting task? Well, there's a, there is a very long story behind that. So I'll just say in kind of pieces, part of it has to do with elements of knowledge and understanding and information that just clarify the nature of the challenge. How are we going to make this work? So the facts, so, the, so just the information alone. Yeah, the information on the ground, which, yeah. which for various reasons was a bit more complicated for us to get to. When we, when we got there, it was yeah. clear, okay, these are really sobering statistics. How do, we, how do we grapple with that? So the numbers are the numbers, and they the, tell a story. Yeah, and they tell a story, and then you have to figure out how do you interpret that? Because while the numbers are the numbers, actually they can get wrapped in so many, so many different other things, ways. Yeah. How do we want to understand how, what that set of statistics suggests to us about the challenges? So mm -hmm. let's deal with that as, with as much clarity, as much transparency, as much honesty as possible. This is not my problem. This isn't even any one person's problem. This is the, uh, institutional and larger reality than that. Mm -hmm. It's an educational challenge that many, many institutions are facing. Mm -hmm. So let's lay it on the, on the full scale table. Then let's also lay it on the part of the table that's really our particular part of the table. Then let's figure out what our particular challenges are and what can we do about that. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the first wave. Yeah. Then when you're looking at all those things, you have to say, Okay, we have to consider all options. There's a person connected to Fuller who I greatly love named Bill Brem. He always says when you're having a, a thought exercise, begin with the universe. So he always just says, don't let yourself get boxed into a corner. Begin with the universe. If, hmm. if, the, if the God of all things is the God who's guiding you, then don't start in a corner. Start big. With, a, hmm. with a big hope and a big possibility rather hmm. than with fear and anxiety and, and scarcity as, oh, the, as the number one lead. So following the Bill Brem suggestion then, you know, thinking, okay, let's, cut, let's bring this set of challenges to the universe and ask, what is the role of Fuller Theological Seminary in helping to form Christian leaders for the church all around the world? Mm. And how could that work best be done mm. in a way that is uh, appropriate to our mission, scalable in the way that's appropriate to a, a seminary rooted in the West, uh, in a context where we have already 75 countries and 120 denominations and campuses in various parts of the country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. How do we make sense of all of that and figure out what kind of inflection point this is and what kind of life it might bring us to? Hmm. Then the next question is, how do you really have all that kind of really honest conversation with your key leaders? Hmm which includes not only the administrative leaders, but it includes the faculty. It also includes very centrally the trustees. So mm. they are ones, in our case, uh, many of our trustees have served for multiple decades. This is the one and only place that they've ever known Fuller to be. It's the only place Fuller's ever been. Their identification and intertwined connection to buildings that have some of their names on them and uh, other kinds of icons that tell you whether this or that or the other thing matters and has history and narrative, all that has to be worked through. So can we come to a place of deep unity within the Board of Trustees? And I think one very significant piece of this was that uh, over time, through the process of listening carefully, considering these things carefully, disclosing everything as fully and candidly as you can, you come to a common mind. And quite amazingly, our trustees are unanimous in, in their vision of of where Fuller should go, of what it should be about, of what it, these implications, how serious are they are. Are you kidding me? Are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. How in the world did you pull that off? Well, I just think it's a matter of, uh, it's a gift of grace is absolutely the answer. But it's also to say, careful listening. It's like, let's make sure that we understand all the implications. Are you hearing all the nuances? Do you get all the questions that we have to letting uh, there be as much room as possible for every possible question to be heaped onto the pile mm. so that you're not trying to pre-shape the narrative. You know, we, when it very first came up, I said, I have done my research and it turns out for the fourth time in Fuller's history, we're now gonna have a conversation that we've had three other times and never acted on. But now we have a new set of statistics and we have a new set of circumstances in education in the church. Now let's ask a question in a fresh way. Now do you, so practically, as I hope this is speaking to people that are navigating change, right. navigating potential endings, 
um, and can glean from some of the leadership that's on display. Are you presenting this to a board? Have you done pre-meetings, like one-on-ones with many of the board members? Although y'all's boards is huge. It is big. So that's a lot of pre-meetings. Do you go in knowing that I've got that I've got to convince the room, or do you go in saying, I'm just gonna put this out here and really let the outcome be the outcome? How are you postured as you get ready to start this campaign? I, I, I don't think that I'm a politicking leader, so I don't yeah. tend to go around trying to get people on the team in advance. There were certain, peop- certain trustees that were more involved than others by the nature of what they do on the Board of Trustees to yeah. be more informed than mm-hmm. others were about what was happening. But I'm a pretty open-handed leader. Like, I don't have a stake in an outcome. I have a stake in community and a stake in process and a stake in mission. But that alone is a really big nuance, Mark. Right, it is a big nuance, but like, it's a hugely freeing one from my point of view. Oh yeah, I, I mean, I, but not a stake in the outcome. Like, how do you not have a stake in the outcome? Because I actually think we share together a common commitment to making the best decision. Hmm. That I have a stake in. I, yeah. We all have a stake in that. But I could be wrong about what the right decision is. So I'm very aware that, that I need an honest, active, thoughtful, critical, diverse community of people that are going to actually wrestle with the facts yeah. on the ground. So one of the things is not to, get, not to become so married to your idea that you create an environment where you're not open to feedback, collaboration. I hope not. Well, because a lot right. of times, a lot of leaders are in the room, and you can just tell they've married to this idea, right? And they are fighting for this idea, right? And they're asking for collaboration, but they're really seeking endorsement, right? And that, thus, the campaigning and different. So that that's a whole nother way of leadership. That's what you're saying, right? And that's yeah. not the way that I try to lead. Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm much more a believer that while there could be occasions, and I'm always open to the thought that God can give me a, a direction that I would feel was really so clear that I couldn't not do this. Mm. But in my whole life of ministry, I can only think of maybe a couple of instances of that. Mm. I'm primarily aware of thinking, we, I wanna be as discerning and critical as possible, I wanna be as creative as possible. Mm. So, beginning with the universe, I don't wanna get cornered, either my corner or your corner or anyone else's corner. Mm. I don't wanna be drawn down a rabbit hole. I don't wanna mm. be distracted from thinking of things that are outside the box. So let's put it all on the table. What if Fuller open-handedly asked, should we stay in Pasadena? And then we go down the road of asking, well, what would be the criteria by which we would decide to stay or go? Mm. We made a long list of the questions that we would feel needed in some way to be satisfied. Anybody have any suggestions about how we might engage a process of discernment? So we called for uh, a weekly day of fasting and prayer that went on for Um, about a year Mm. uh, around fasting and prayer that was a process of discernment. Mm. I kept people informed pretty much weekly during that time on the trustee board uh, about what it was that we were grappling with and what the issues were and what we were discovering or not discovering. We went through a process uh, eventually of of exploring when we got to a a certain stage, we thought, well, we should start now really thinking quite specifically geographically. Do we stay in California? Do we stay in Southern California? Do we stay in LA? All those questions needed to be grappled with. Then, the, then we needed to grapple with the questions of well, where in this enormous place called LA County, when we finally determined that that was where we needed and wanted to stay, where could we move that would potentially meet the criteria that would satisfy a whole variety of things that we were concerned mm. to satisfy? And we went through a process that took many months of as much open exploring uh, as far south as Long Beach, as far north as Santa Clarita, as far west as Hollywood, as far east as Pomona, all to say any kind of configuration, uh, pre-built building, skyscraper, uh, (laughs) shopping mall, every kind of nightmare or hopeful situation you could imagine. And that's where the creativity comes in. Right, and you can't really, you can't imagine it until you're actually trying to imagine it, right? You can't just sit in open space and think, about something, you yeah. have to actually engage in some way get around in real possibilities. Wow. So, um, so a, a process went on, we discerned what we believed was a surprising possibility. Now the interesting thing was, that came as a lateral move, something not at all was on our radar. 
it's not in the end what we're doing, this lateral thing that came up, but it led us to something that was the right thing. Huh. So it was like, oh, that's so interesting. We went down this road thinking maybe that would be the road. And so, that, so in the process, something else came up over here right. that, that ended up being the bridge to get you to where right. you ended up. Exactly. But this ended up just was, not was, even being not, a thing at it all. It was not really very relevant to what interesting. we're doing. So it, it's quite an amazing process, right? Now, in that course of that, you have all kinds of conflicting feelings that have to be expressed and acknowledged within the board. Everywhere from the most personal kind of grief and sadness over the thought of, oh my gosh, how can we do this? How can we possibly think of not being in Pasadena? To people saying, oh no, this is, you know, I really grieve over thinking that we're not going to be in Pasadena, but I am thrilled at the possibility of a pivot that will set up Fuller for the most thriving possible future. And you're managing those emotions. Right. And inviting them, not just managing them. I'm wanting them, right? I'm wanting them on the table. And what are you doing with them, Mark? Well, I'm, for one thing, just acknowledging them. Um, I'm saying if we as a complicated community of 41 people, as the board of trustees at Fuller is, is going to have an honest conversation and discern the single most, at least geographically important thing that will have been decided since the original decision to plant in Pasadena, mm. We have to get there with as much integrity, honesty, forthrightness with one another as You've possible. You've got to be a nine on the Enneagram. What are you on the Enneagram? I don't know. I've never done you don't, You've never done the Enneagram? I haven't. Oh, my but God. But I'll be a nine if that's uh, <laughs> Well, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not that familiar with it. But I'm an eight, so I'm all about control and, and, all, and authority. And I'm like, oh, my, inviting emotions. No, let's get on. Let's move. Well, exactly. A nine is kind of like a but, peacemaker. They, they right, want to bring. Yeah. Right. But see, the thing about, about what I'm trying to get at is, I understand why there's instincts of control and wanting to manage something, but I want to manage what is actually the chosen, honorable, life-giving future that we all would want to embrace, yeah. rather than forcing somebody to have to accept something that they resent. Yeah. yeah. The same thing is really, of course, has been needed within the faculty. Very complicated thing because you have a, a, a culture of, of a faculty is a very specific and um, particular kind of group of people who have a very settled sense of place that's part of what mm -hmm. allows faculty to do mm -hmm. their important scholarship and work. And yet the wider entity of Fuller is a much more dynamic thing than the enterprise of any one particular scholar's work or teacher's work can yeah. be. You want to preserve all of that. None of that is anything we're interested in putting at risk. But you're asking them to enter a change system which is completely outside their bailiwick. And that's just the nature of the game. Hmm. So that's been more complicated. It's more varied. Yeah. It's harder to create. Uh, unity, um, and yet I have to say one of the great gifts of Fuller's faculty is that probably most people wouldn't choose to come to Fuller unless they had some sense of entrepreneurial vision that would yeah. make them want to be in a setting like this. Yeah. And and though people have, of course, as I do, I mean, I have to own my own feelings of, I'm not interested in being the president that's leading Fuller during a period of time when we're changing campus yeah. sites. That's yeah. not anything I set up uh, a dream yeah. for. Um, but it is the challenge and an opportunity this moment. So let's jointly together own all of that and now determine for the, through a roughly parallel process, how do you come to as much understanding and consensus as possible? Now, in the shared governance, this is really the decision of the Board of Trustees, not the decision of the faculty. Yeah. But the decision of the faculty is extremely important oh, yeah. uh, in the trustees, of course. You gotta, in, so in many ways, you're doing a lot of pastoring. There's a lot of pastoring. Yeah, yeah. a lot of pastoring and a lot of leading. I, I dare not, though, because you said it, if we're going to have a conversation about endings, we've also got to acknowledge the reality of there's an opportunity for beginnings. Right. If we take a few moments and just tell us about the beginnings that you're excited about when you think about Fuller. Yeah. Well, let me do it by holding both things together. So the day when we went to visit um, the site of where we believe Fuller is going to be located, the night before that, we were here on our Pasadena campus and we'd had a very meaningful time together as trustees, again, refining and clarifying what we were going to do the next day, which was mm -hmm. going to take the trustees for the first time to the site mm. where we could imagine that we were going to be and where we were going to sit together and imagine mm. that. So it happened that the night that we were meeting was uh, a beautiful uh, winter night in, in Pasadena and the campus was very quiet. It was late on a Sunday night. And we went out and stood in the center of the campus here in Pasadena. And I had us just sort of form a circle and have this time of just 
acknowledging with deep gratitude the faithfulness and love of God for this place and all that's happened for Fuller mm -hmm. in 70 years in this setting, right? An amazing time of just prayer and thanksgiving and rejoicing and memory, holding on and treasuring in an Ebenezer building-like way, that is what this place has been. Mm -hmm. So whatever tomorrow brings, it's not about denying or forgetting or neglecting anything about what's happened here, mm. right? This has been a real place with wow. profound meaning. Now let's lay that down and go to what might be our new place. Wow. A place that is about as dramatically different as this place uh, could be. It needs to be built. There's, it's a completely different kind of setting, different city. But what was so amazing about that to me was that um, that I think we could do all that with integrity because there had been no coercion. Mm. There was no feeling that now Mark is forcing us to go there when we'd rather stay here. That's not what we were doing. Mm. We had decided that this is what we were doing and now we're going to uh, lay, lay these things down and take up a new beginning. I've always been taken by those two parallel texts. I'm sure you know them in Isaiah 43 and Isaiah 46. Isaiah 43 says, um, you do not consider the former things, for behold, I've come to do a new thing. Mm. In Isaiah 46, remember the former things. Mm -hmm. So I think the challenge is always this question of how do I remember and how do I forget? Mm. Those are the things that are all part of this transition of endings, right? That's how do I lay something down and how do I take up the next thing? Yeah. And it's, it's not to lay down that God wasn't faithful then. Absolutely, God was faithful then. Don't let what I did in the past be the thing that hampers me from being able to do a new thing today. Mm. That's what Isaiah 43 is about. Isaiah 46 is saying, but remember the God of the former things. Yeah. And that God will be the same today in the new things as he was in the former things, but he's going to do now a new thing. Mm. So the same God, same people, new reality. Mm. So the ending is one thing and the beginning is a new thing. So the new thing is an opportunity to, to think about embracing a new community. It's a new opportunity to, to architecturally express our mission in a way that's gonna help breed, I think, a much closer sense of community. Yeah. It's gonna create technological possibilities, which I think give us a chance to be able to engage the, the church in distributed education uh, all around the country, but really actually all around the world. Mm. So it feels as though it cues us up for the same kind of scholarship, the same sort of commitment to degrees, while also in a, at a moment of transition to add to that a whole new set of leadership offerings on our leadership platform and through online education, which extends still further the chance for Fuller's reach to be even mm. uh, broader and deeper. Now the question is how can we learn to do that with formation, commitment to formation, a commitment to community, a commitment to embodied life, not to just as it were virtual yeah. learning or virtual community. That has to be worked out. And, and I think we've learned a lot of lessons because Fuller's been at this process of online education for a long time. And it, uh, the results that come out of the evaluations regularly give us an indication that we're going down the right road. Good. However, we're absolutely, as a learning community, wide open to continuing to figure out how do we do this even better. What we know, everyone knows, within five years, education will have changed yet again. And within 10 years, it will look still more dramatically different. Yeah. I don't know if you know that um, wonderful thing that was uh, quoted and told by um, Tom Freeman in, Friedman in his book, uh, Thank You for Being Late, where he talks about cultural transitions and kind of the overwhelming speed of Moore's Law, you know, where the capacity of technology doubles every two years. Yeah. And Intel apparently wanted to try to quantify this in a way that could help people get their mind around it. So they came up with this analogy. They said, if cars had changed at the same rate that technology in general has changed. If you had started with a 1971 VW bug and it changed in the same speed that happened uh, with technology, it would go now 300,000 miles uh, per hour. You could go 2 million miles on one gallon and the car would cost 4 cents. Wow. Now, that's just a small way of trying to capture we're, we are all caught in this unbelievable technological uh, innovation. That holds incredible opportunities. As people who believe in an incarnate God, who believe in a resurrected God, who believe in a God who's uh, made a, a meaningful material world, 
we're not interested in trying to promote virtual community and virtual technology and virtual education. Yeah. We want real people in real places and real lives to be deeply affected by the gospel, the education, and the formation that can happen through uh, what we're trying to offer. So we know that technology is happening, that change is happening that fast. We want to be a part of acknowledging that and leaning into it rather than mm. away from it, mm. knowing that we'll get it right, we'll get it wrong. We have to keep being uh, continuous iterative change. Mm. But in that process, we want to take full advantage of how technology can enable us to be one of the sources of theological and spiritual formation and education in the world at a time that I think is unprecedentedly urgent wow. in its need. Forgetting and remembering at the same time. Forgetting and remembering. That's, that's beautiful. always the challenge. Oh, that's so good. We do something at Fellowship called the Question of the Day. Yes. And uh, each episode, I like to end with the rapid round, rapid fire round of just questions. <laughs> All right? Sure. So, um, and you're right to laugh early. Um, so I'm just going to I'm just going to throw them out and you just throw them back at me. Yep. Ready? All right, here we go. If you could join any musical ensemble in history, which would it be? Uh gosh, I'd probably say the Rolling Stones. Really? You look like a Rolling Stones guy. Are you <laughs> don't, This looks Rolling Stones. Uh, it's don't very Rolling Stones. I know. It's very Rolling Stones. It's my feeling. Are you a musician? I have played lots of musical instruments. Yeah. I could I could, I'd, yeah. I'd imagine painter, musician, well, you're you the man, do by You're the yeah. man. What is something that everyone else loves that you think is overrated? Disneyland. <laughs> really? You've been, obviously. Many times. Okay, all right. And I do love it. I'm but, not, it's but, just but overrated. It's a little I don't overrated. Kind of get it, yeah. Right. Happiest place on earth, I'm not quite ready to go there. <laughs> <laughs> what other profession did you consider pursuing? Uh, architecture, um, politics, uh, diplomacy, um, and art. I think in your job, you get to do a little bit of all of that. <laughs> Especially now, architecture. Yeah. You, I mean, I think you're going to hit all of those. Mm -hmm. um, what is something you're bummed that you're still bad at? Wow, I am really bad at uh, daily organization. Really? Yeah. I'm pretty good at master organization, but like the ordinary small details. I'm a, I'm a bit of an absent-minded professor in that way. Like, Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So you got a strong assistant. Indeed. Do you depend on her? I mean, do you lean, have you, oh, learned, yeah. you know how to lean on her to? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, she, she's phenomenal. She's she is phenomenal. great. Um, what, um, what is something you used to say that you don't say anymore? Mm -hmm. Nothing's coming to my mind. Mm. Well, maybe one thing. Early, early in my Christian life, I, I was an adult convert. And early in my Christian life, I was in a setting where people would kind of glibly say, um, God is responsible for this. Mm. And over time, I became skeptical of the use of that language. Hmm. Not that God can't be responsible for almost anything imaginable. I would just rather confess it differently. I would rather say, uh, I believe that God did that. Hmm. And the reason why I'd make that distinction is that I want to acknowledge that I'm actually a, an interpreter and that I'm not claiming absolute, unquestionable knowledge. And when the declaration is made, God did this, it feels to me like I've just remove myself from the equation. And the reason why it matters is people who suffer, whose prayers are not answered. Yeah. And when I just get to come along and glibly say, uh, God did X in my life or yeah. in that circumstance, and they go, so what do I make now when it's mostly silent? Yeah. Then the inference that they carry is, oh, I guess God just doesn't want to speak to you. That's actually not what I think is usually happening. Mm. Um, so I want to be more modulated and humble about it than just to assert that I get to declare God's here, God's there. Um, it's all about me telling you how to see absolute reality. Yeah. That just doesn't seem faithful. That's good. That's good. You got away with words, man. Oh, you're a wordsmith. <laughs> I want to be more modulated. Like, I never would have thought to put that together. <laughs> Albert. I love you're that. The, you're the man with the words. No, no. Like, 
like, I can't wait to tell my wife tonight. It's like, honey, I'm working. I want to be more modulated. And she's she's gonna be like, are you ready to go up the key? Like, what do you what do you mean more modulated? That's brilliant. I love it. Okay, um, here's here it is. Um, what's something you I, I wasted a little bit of this coffee on this rug. That's it. Oh, you know what? I can't even see it anymore. Indeed. The color is the color. It's okay. absorbing, yeah. I just thought for a second, this could be a very expensive rug. <laughs> and it's a part of the cashing out on Fuller, so I don't want to take away. This could Our probably, future rests in This could garbage, probably really. pay for a building. The, this exactly. Could be the, the, okay. <laughs> All right. What is, um, what is something you pray about a lot that you don't talk about often? Uh, I pray a lot about um, parts of the world that I don't get to see every day that mm. have people in them that I treasure like my family. Mm. Uh, but to over talk that is a hard thing to do when other people aren't connected necessarily in those ways. No. Um, so I think that, I think another thing though is that I'm aware, I, pro- I think I pray the Jesus prayer about a thousand times a day. Mm. Uh, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy either on me or on us. That feels like a pretty continuous kind of fugue line through mm. uh, the day, and I don't talk about it a lot, but it feels to me like it's the it's the base of everything that I'm trying to do. That's good. That's good. Um, when was the last time you had to say I'm sorry? Oh gosh, <laughs> it's so frequent. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe probably this morning. This morning. Uh, yes. Mm. What is something that is often misunderstood about you? Um, what an interesting question. I think that people don't, I think that people think that my life is um, easier and simpler than it actually is. Hmm. Um, and. I think that's probably an assumption of not really getting, uh, not, I feel like I'm pretty transparent, but I'm aware that uh, like anybody, you'd have to know somebody well to probably get behind all the that's there. But I think there's always, uh, my sense of my life is a whole lot more complicated than the way it often seems to get represented back to me. Hmm. Um, I think it's a function of being a tall, white, educated male. I think it's a function of being a person in a position of influence. I think it's about feeling like you have an ease of, of with words or with various things, mm. which can then feel like it's pretty simple. Mm. Um, that's not my experience of it. Mm. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, last one. Oh, no, 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 two more. What's an area of your leadership you're still growing in? Uh, I still think I'm working on what to do about areas of about ways of handling conflict. Mm. Um, I have I'm miles, miles, miles beyond where I was when I began, but I still think that really healthy conflict is a great thing, mm. and that it's a very productive, and even an essential thing. Mm. And I have way more courage uh, to do that now than I would have ever had in the past. Um, and I still think. There's certain kinds of conflicts that I'm aware I really don't want to enter. It mm. feels like either the stakes are too high or I feel more insecure, more fearful that it will go in a way, go badly in a way that won't be able to lead to recovery, mm. right? The context where I'm more bold are settings where it feels like, let's have a really good argument so that we can come out with a really good um, outcome. Right, I mean, I, that is, yeah. but where you're gonna have a, a conflict over things that are really almost unsettleable, you're just going to be in permanent, probably long-standing difference of opinion mm-hmm. about a given thing. And where saying something as easy as, uh, let's just agree to disagree, will not be a happy outing mm-hmm. outcome, right? Mm-hmm. I think that, I, I, I have a hard time with that. I don't, I don't like those things. I'm not yeah. wanting to be at odds. Um, yeah. So it's that residue of continuing to work out, yeah. uh, not wanting to make grandma cry. In that case, though, it might be me that it, I don't want to end up uh, making cry, or or the other person yeah. by saying to them, "Really, no, yeah, actually, just yeah. no, no, it's just not enough." I mean, we've had some conversations about yeah. moments when you've had to say that to people, yeah. And I remember feeling then 
as I was hearing you talk, that same kind of concern. I mean, in the end, you have to do it as a leader. Yeah. You have to do it. And it is unpleasant, to oh, say the least. Yeah. It's, it's, you feel undone. Right. Yeah, yeah. Last one. Uh, favorite cuss word. Somehow I, I knew. love the response. <laughs> I, knew, I, I knew the final question would be some <laughs> Albert turn. Uh, I think my favorite cuss word is is probably <laughs> um, but it depends on the circumstances. <laughs> has never sounded so elegant. Yeah. So elegant. Like, it's like <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, it's it, the funny thing is that even before I was a Christian. I grew up in a house over my dad, not a Christian, um, was a vehement anti-swear word guy. Mm. And it was not prudishness. It was like, that's inadequate. Mm. Like, you've got to have a better vocabulary than mm. that. If you have really strong feelings, find the right word. Don't just bail. Now, sometimes wow. the right word is a swear word. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Interesting. What Interesting. would yours be? Mine is, it's, I think mine is Right. But the reason why it got, it didn't become that until pastoral ministry. Pastoral ministry did that to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's something so stress relieving. Yes, yes. About using such an extreme, yes. extremely secular word uh, that's just, it relieves stress. You know, when I was in, in Berkeley, uh, there were two or three other pastors that we used to have this joke about, um, you know, how some pastors have anxiety dreams about they're going to be, they don't have their notes or they're naked in front of their uh -huh. congregation or whatever. Uh -huh. Our joke was that we would suddenly be seized with what we developed as a so-called disease called pastoral Tourette syndrome, <laughs> where, where in the middle of preaching, suddenly you were just seized with this desire to just swear endlessly at the yes, congregation. Yes, and anything yes. and everything that you could possibly think of, you just sort of unleashed. Just let it go. Yeah, yeah. and it was uncontrollable. It was oh a kind my of goodness, Tourette that would be the condition. worst. Yeah. Dr. Mark Labberton, thank you so much. This is so good. Thank you.